when you have that sort of visceral response to something uh, where it just grabs you like that and rivets your attention and you know what's going on in such a profound way. I don't think there's any other species out there quite like that. Grizzly bears activate some part of who we are. They tap into something in our ancestral souls and make us pause and reflect about our, our place in the natural world. Grizzly bears have been on this continent for 50,000 years, about 1850, we may have had roughly 50,000 grizzly bears. Europeans in a 100 year period killed off 98% of the bears that we once had. The Endangered Species Act was passed in the mid 1970s. So our recovery plans are based on basically the science that was done up through the late 1980s. Since then, we have learned a lot. And virtually none of that new scientific information is incorporated in how we judge recovery, how we think about a world where grizzly bears and humans might live together. What do we owe these animals that were devastated by our European ancestors? We're at a crossroads where we can either continue that process of recovering bears and letting them reclaim some of their historic range. Or we can pull back from that and not invest resources in having them in new places. There have been a number of emerging threats for grizzly bears. Uh, since, say, around the mid-1990s. One of those, one serious threat, has been burgeoning numbers of people either living in this region or visiting here. That translates into that many more people out in the backcountry, out on trails, on highways. There's threats, though, that emerge from changes in availability and distribution of foods what I would call an, an, an unraveling of the natural environment. For example, looking at Greater Yellowstone. At one time, there were four foods or food groups that accounted for probably 90% of the energy and nutrients that bears ingested. We've seen between 75 and 80 percent of all the mature whitebark pine die in a short 10-year period by a bark beetle epidemic that was unleashed by a warming climate. Cutthroat trout has been essentially functionally extirpated as a, as a bear food by the introduction of a non-native lake trout. We look at army cutworm moths. That's a food that persists. But if we look out 100 years, all the projections are that we will lose 99% of the alpine environments that we currently have. And with that, we'll go moths. And when we look at the final food, elk, bison, elk in particular, for various reasons, elk populations have declined dramatically. All of these threats are starting to manifest in unsustainably high levels of grizzly bear mortality. Grizzly bear is gonna go out fighting. Um, it's gonna really try hard to 
to figure out ways to make up those calories in its diet. Once they've learned that they can get food in a subdivision, on a ranch, at a backcountry campsite, they're going to keep coming back. The good news is people have been spending the last 30 years figuring out lots of great ways to prevent conflicts with bears. So to achieve meaningful recovery, what we're going to need to do is connect those ecosystems, allow bears to move freely from either one existing population to another or from existing populations into areas where there's ample potential uh, to support them. The key challenge in allowing bears to move back into this connective habitat is going to be conflict prevention. Because a lot of these places, they're far outside the historic recovery zones that were designated when grizzly bears were initially listed. So there hasn't been a lot of focus on getting, the, getting those communities, getting those areas ready to have grizzly bears back as neighbors. Grizzly bears can move into these places, but if they immediately start finding garbage, pet food, unprotected livestock, they're going to get into conflicts and they're going to get killed. So we still have quite a bit of work to do. If we prematurely take Endangered Species Act protections away and we don't have the resources in place, we don't have the plans in place for how we're going to live with them and allow them to adapt to a changing world by spreading out and accessing more of the historic range, that they could be in big trouble. for the Northern Continental Divide and the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, our two largest populations. We probably have no more than a thousand bears in each of those. So neither one of those populations could be considered viable by that standard. So somehow you need to get to thousands of bears and we can't do it within the confines of the current conservation areas. If we don't get rid of these recovery targets that are much, much too small in terms of numbers and distribution, then we put bears at considerable risk. Each of these individual populations don't stand a good chance of surviving. We owe bears a lot. We owe it to them to figure out how to live with them. We hold the, the fate and the future of grizzly bears in our hands. This is an instance where how we respond is going to be a commentary on us.